the title of the message this morning is uh, Risking It All. Um, sometimes as believers, we kind of feel like that guy walking on the tightrope, do we not? Feeling like if we take one step to the left or one step to the right, if we fall, we're falling to our death because this world is always trying to push us off balance, trying to make us feel like the little tightrope that we're walking, like that guy in that picture, is not right. It's not where we need to be. And this whole high holy day season, as far as Rosh Hashanah starting on all the way to the end, but especially in these, the 10 days of awe, the main theme of the 10 days of awe is reflection, right? Repentance. Looking at yourself and saying, how can I be better? What have I done in the past as far as mistakes that I've made? How can I fix those mistakes and not make them? How can I be a better representative of God? Because at the end of the day, that's who we are, right? We're representatives for God here on earth. We're, reflect, we're, we're called to reflect His love into the darkness. That is this world. A big Jewish concept um, is the word zahor, and in Hebrew that means remember. Every Jewish holiday is about remembering, right? Remembering what went on. Remembering what the Jewish people survived. Remembering how God is always there for us to protect us when we need Him. And He's always there when we need to talk to Him, when we need to entreat Him with our worries, with our problems. But that word is always there throughout the whole high holiday season as well as in the 10 days of awe, is remembering, zakhor. And as we reflect, as we remember, and as we remind ourselves of the things we've done in the past that we need to get better on and, and improve in our lives, I think a big question that we can ask ourselves leading up to Yom Kippur as well is, what does God want from me as a believer in His Son Yeshua? What does God want from me? And what He really wants, he, he, he could probably want a plethora of things based off of each individual here in this room, or if you're watching, but I think the main theme of what He wants from you as a believer is for you to risk it all. And what does that really mean, risking it all? It means every single day you wake up, every single day you go out and do what God's called you to do, whatever occupation you may be in, you're being different. You're standing for what's right. You're risking being cast out or viewed as someone who's not in line and not with what the world wants. You're risking being shunned. You're risking people looking down on you but it's worth it. So what, does go, what goes into that? What goes into risking it all? And that's what I want to get at this morning. So in essence, risking it all really means giving it your all. So if we could take out our outlines here and uh, follow along with me, risking it all really means giving it your all. And that's what I want to get into. What goes into giving it your all every single day? What do we need to do? to take the steps to do that. Especially in these last past 10 to 10 days of Oz, we reflect and we remember, how do we give it our all? I had a coach years ago in basketball that was really influential in my life, and he's had a lot of different types of quotes. But one that sticks with me to this day is, you're either two feet in or you're two feet out. You can't have one foot in and one foot out. It's not gonna work. You're not going to be the person you want to be if you have one foot in and one foot out. And that ties perfectly into giving it your all. As believers, we can't be lukewarm. We can't have one foot in and one foot out and say, okay, I'm going to obey God at this point in time, and then I'm going to go off and do my own thing over here, and then I'm going to come back and really listen to him and say, God, I need you. Talk to me. I need your guidance, and then go away when things are right. It has to be a really, really common fluent process of listening to God, two feet in, all the time, giving it your all, while you're risking, like I said, being shunned, being rejected because of being a believer, of putting your faith in Messiah. Because I'm sure many of us have gotten looked down on by people in the world saying, why are you putting your faith in something like that? It's not worth it. You should go by the two hands as the strength of your two hands, go get it done. Why are you trusting in something that we can't see or can't feel or can't hear right now? That's worthless. That's what we're risking. 
And at times, like that guy in that tightrope, we feel like we're off balance and we might fall off that tightrope as we're walking that line of where God wants us to walk. So giving it your all, it means obedience. That's the biggest part of the equation here, obedience. While we're giving it our all, it's on a daily basis obeying what God wants for our lives, being in complete line with where God wants us, right? It's understanding that while we read God's word and we're seeking his presence on a daily basis, the doors that are open, walking through them. Obeying what we read in God's word as far as conduct between people we know as friends, between people we don't know, between our family members, our, our, our friends, people who are set above us as far as authority figures. Obeying God's word, obedient, and being obedient to God himself. If he's leading you somewhere, follow him. If he's blessing you and telling you to go in a certain direction, be obedient to that direction. Follow him. So it means obedience. And it's really traditional around this time as far as the 10 days of Adah, go into the Akedah, which is Genesis 22. So if you could turn with me to Genesis 22 in your, in your, uh, in your Bibles, it's a really perfect picture of someone who is giving it their all and risking everything because they honor and respect and they're obeying God. And in Genesis 22, we see Abraham doing this. Now, what's going on in Abraham's life at this time, right? God told him, go to the land where I show you and follow it. Abraham didn't know where the land was. He just followed, right? He obeyed. It was unknown. He'd been steeped in idolatry that surrounded him in the land he was in. But he chose to follow the one true God and obeyed. So as we go into the Akedah, I want you to understand that Abraham is used as a figure to where we can follow that example because he actually completed it and did it. And we can use him as an example of a human being who followed and obeyed God and was blessed for it. So follow along in your outlines. Abraham was tested and he obeyed. In Genesis 22, verse 1, it says, Now it came about after these things, and I'll pause there for a second, after these things, meaning for years and years and years, his wife Sarah had been barren. God had promised Abraham that you're going to be a father of many nations. And Abraham's saying, what's going on here, God? You're saying that I'm going to be a father of many nations, but I have no children. If, unless you're planning to work some, some kind of miracle here and just conjure children out of thin air, there's nothing going on here right now. So along this whole process, God is reassuring Abraham, there's going to be a promise. I'm going to fulfill my promise. And he does, and Isaac comes around. Good old Isaac. And Abraham pours everything he has into him. His wisdom raises him, because this is, the, this is the prized child, right? This is the promised child that God's going to flow through him as far as make Abraham the father of many nations. This is Isaac. But he, let's look at what God tells Abraham as Isaac's a young, young boy. Now, it doesn't say the exact age, but Isaac is a young, young, young boy, young kid. And we follow along. It, it, says, it, it says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. Abraham said, Hineni, here I am. And, he, and God said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Pause. Think about that. Everything that had just happened, Sarah being barren for years, all the anguish that Abraham had went through and saying, what's going on, God? Why aren't you giving me this promised child that you promised me? I followed you. You told me, Lech Lecha, I went. Now you're telling me that I have to go sacrifice this promised child on a place where you're going to tell me? It doesn't say that Abraham stalled. It doesn't say that Abraham went a month or two later. It doesn't say that Abraham cursed God for this command. Abraham obeyed. Verse 3, Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he split the wood for the burnt offering 
and set out and went to the place which God had told him. He went. God was testing him, but regardless, Abraham obeyed. It's the truth. We're going to be tested, but we need to obey as well. Folks, God is going to test you every single day. You're going to be tested by the world every single day. You are going to test yourselves every single day. But the one common thing you have to do is you have to obey God because he is the ultimate wisdom, the ultimate source of knowledge, and the ultimate protector that is right there for you as believers because you've put your faith in Messiah. He's there for you. We have to obey him, especially when we're tested, especially when we're pushed to the limit by the world. Things are thrown at us and, thing, and, thing, and aspects of our lives are tested in a way they never have been. We should obey even more because we know that he is the one constant in our lives. That's why reading God's word is so important. Larry says it a lot. Almost every other message or every message that reading the word every single day is so important. Why? Because you're reading God's word in front of you. You can pick it up anytime you want. It's the guidebook and a map to life. Why wouldn't you want to obey it? Because he wants the best for you. It's so important. So we will be tested, but we got to obey. Second, it means total surrender. We have to surrender all of our expectations of how our life should go and let God take the driving wheel. Now that's tough, right? Because the world has continuously programmed us, right, to want control. The world's saying, no, you do it. You have all of the power. You can do everything, right? You can take control of your own life and the strengths and the, and the, the failures and the successes are all on you, but you can do it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to surrender ourselves to any expectation that we have of our life because we're human, we're flawed. We have this vision of our lives of where it should go, but sometimes it's not in line with what God wants for our lives. I can assure you that what God wants for your life is so much better. It's so much more valuable as far as long term because the world is always wanting and taking, and taking, and drawing from you, right? But God's yoke is easy. God's burden is light, and he's always trying to pour into you. But we have to surrender first, humility. So it means total surrender here. And we can see that Abraham surrendered it all. In verse 22, or so, sorry, chapter 22, verse 4, it says, On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. In verse 5, it says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, laid it on his son Isaac, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac, this is how I can tell that Isaac was probably a teenager or a young man. He's looking at this knife. He's looking at this fire, and he's saying, What's going on here? There's no sacrifice. And he goes, Isaac spoke to his father in verse 7 and says, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son, Hineni Haben Shiloh. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Abraham knew God's test, but he was continuously surrendering. He could have given up. He could have turned around and walked away and says, I'm not sacrificing the promised son, no matter what God said. Why would I want to do that after all of the strife and anguish that I had been to get to this point? Why would I want to surrender all that? But we see he did the complete opposite. He trusted and surrendered his expectations as he was being tested. The story I love is uh, the boys of Babylon in Daniel chapter 3. And we see the boys of Babylon surrendered it all. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? In, J in Daniel chapter 3, the nation of Israel is in exile in Babylon. The temple's destroyed. The one symbol of God's presence is wiped off the face of the earth, right? It's not there anymore. And the nation of Israel is in a land thousands of miles away. 
but the boys of Babylon still chose to surrender it all. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was at this point in his reign was obsessed with himself, his self-worth, his glory, even to the point where he thought he, he was a god, built a huge monument to himself. And throughout times in the day, he would sound a trumpet or a noise, and if you heard that noise, you had to bow down to that monument, which could be seen throughout the whole land. But there were three boys who chose not to. There were three boys who said, no matter what happens, I'm going to surrender everything as far as what I probably know will happen to me. I'm not going to even think about worshiping that monument because I know what that means. That means I'm not following the God of my fathers. That means I'm not trusting. That means I'm not obeying what God had told my fathers and my fathers had told us to do was to follow him. The boys of Babylon surrendered it all. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, after they failed to bow down, Nebuchadnezzar brings them to a furnace that he had heated for who he was going to throw into the furnace whoever did not worship that monument, burn them alive, burn them to death. It was so hot that even the guards who were standing by the furnace burned alive. That's how hot this furnace was. This is the consequence that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew they were facing. They still surrendered. Nebuchadnezzar asked them why they're not bowing down to his monument, and this is what they say in verse 16. Nebuchadnezzar, we are not in need of an answer to give to you concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. Verse 18, but if, even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods, nor worship the golden statue that you have set up. They were prepared to surrender their lives, and they understood that they might not be saved, but they understood that God was real. So much more realer than that monument was that they were being called to or forced to worship. They understood the gravity and the weight of that situation. They could face their deaths, but they chose to surrender it all because they knew they were being tested by the God of their fathers. So as they're thrown into the fire and everyone expects them to burn up, what happens? They remain in there. And there's even an additional figure that the the guards are saying, I see an additional man in there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I believe that was Yeshua himself ministering to them and saying, well done, good and faithful servants. I tested you, and thank you for proving that I'm all-powerful, that I'm greater than this monument that you failed to bow down to. So as Nebuchadnezzar sees this go down, he has them pulled out of the furnace And this is what he says to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Blessed be, in verse 28, he says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and surrender their bodies rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. We're called as believers to surrender our own bodies because we know that we have a hope beyond this physical body. Amen? Amen? When we leave this earth, we dwell with him forever, outside of this physical world. We're surrendering all aspects of this to serve him because we know that it's worth it. We know that risking it all and giving it our all means that we're going to be blessed. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood this, and they surrendered themselves at all. They surrendered their own bodies as well. And in the process, glorified God to the point where Nebuchadnezzar himself recognized the situation and blessed the God of Israel, a pagan king. That's the power that God's test has in our lives. No matter what are the odds as far as the forces that come against us, God is able to overcome that through the test that he tests us with if we surrender it. So we need to surrender it all. No matter the circumstances, we need to commit 
to God's will in our lives and surrender all of our expectations. Because it's so much better. The things to follow are so much better if we just surrender and give up what we want in the, in the minute, in the second, in the hour, in the day. We know that years from now, it's so much more worth it. So let's go back into Genesis 22. We see Abraham surrendering it all. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 4, it says, or sorry, rewind. In Job, actually, the book of Job, chapter 37, verse 13, whether for correction or for his earth or for goodness, he causes it to happen. God will cause things in your life to happen for a reason. Whether it's for your own personal growth or for others to see you overcome that and people to want what you have, God causes a lot of things to happen. In my basketball career, there was a point where I was extremely injured to the point where I could barely walk. I didn't know if I could play the sport again. Fast forward 10 years from now, I look back on that, and every second, minute, hour, day, month, year was worth it. Because God taught me things that grew me into the man I am today, that allowed me to face trials that are similar to that and overcome them. But I would never have been able to overcome those trials if I didn't face that initially. We think about Job, what happened to Job, the character in the Bible, in the book of Job. His whole family was taken away from him, all of his riches, his health, everything was stripped away. And everyone was looking to see what Job was going to do. But, God, but Job still blessed God's name, did he not? And by the end of his story, by the end of his life, God blessed Job twice as much as he was before all of this happened because Job overcame. So follow along your outlines in point three. It says it means complete trust. Risking it all and giving it all, it means complete trust. Complete trust that no matter the circumstances, no matter what happens in our lives, the outcome is in perfect alliance with what God wants for our lives. No matter what goes on, we know that we're exactly in God's will. And that's so important as believers. Because remember, there are so many different opinions in this world and so many different ways of thought. But as believers, we believe there's one way of thought, and that's God's will. And being in alignment with God's will. So as we continue in Genesis 22, Abraham trusted completely. In verse 9, it says, Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and Abraham reached out his hand, took his knife to slay his son. He was actually going to go through with this. That's to the point that Abraham surrendered everything, was obedient, and he trusted God. Hebrews 11 is what we like to call the hall of faith. There's a lot of characters in this chapter that, God, that is written in that chapter that highlights people who have put their faith in God no matter what, no matter the circumstances. And Abraham's in this hall of faith. And I want to take a pause here and look at this real quick because it highlights how much Abraham trusted God to the point Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and the one who had received the promises was offering up his only son. It was he, it was he to whom it was said, through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, in verse 19, from which he also received him back as a type. God trusted, or sorry, Abraham trusted God to the point where he even trusted that God could resurrect Isaac from the dead. But he was still testing him, right? At the end of the day, we want to be named on that same plateau as Abraham. We want to be worthy enough to be in the hall of faith as well when it's all said and done. And we can only do that by risking it all on a daily basis and giving it our all and trusting in him. 
trusting in God's promise for our lives. And that's unique for every single person in this room. God's promises to you are unique, and there's one overarching one, that he will be there, he will never forsake you, nor leave you. But that's between you and him, in your relationship with God, in your promises that he has with you, and following him on a daily basis. The clan from Shushan, from Shushan trusted in God, trusted completely in what was going on. Right? The book of Esther Haman and the nations wanted to destroy Israel. We hear this every Purim. We go through the story every Purim. But it's so important to understand that these people in this story were risking everything, especially Esther. Her people were going to be wiped off the face of the earth. The world wanted to destroy her. But she knew that she was put in that position for that exact perfect moment, as Mordecai said to her, her uncle. She trusted completely. Mordecai trusted completely. And as Esther goes to the king, and as the story unfolds, and Israel is saved, and actually Haman is the one that is killed, it just goes to show that if you completely trust in God, anything is possible but that's not easy, trusting in God. Because there are so many things that are coming against us all the time to try to dissuade us from putting our trust in God. We wouldn't, the Jewish people in the nation of Israel wouldn't be there if the clan of Susan did not completely trust God. Understanding that they were in that position for a reason, Mordecai and Esther, you are in a position for a reason in your life. Who you're surrounded with. Where you're at in life as far as work goes. Your friends. You're in a certain position of power and influence for a certain reason. Let God's light shine. Trust Him. Trust Him completely. And understand that whatever you do and say, you're representing God. So follow along, continue in our outlines. We need to trust completely and understand that if we do that every single day, we can build habits. And as believers, that's so important because humans were flawed. And if we don't trust him every single day, we have the ability to fall off that tightrope wire in the first slide. We give the world an opportunity to push us off our balance and to speak in our ear, the enemy to speak in our ear and tell us that We don't have to trust him all of the time, which is completely wrong as we know. So as we continue, it means proving our love. And I want to preface this point as well as proving our love. God already knows that we love him. We wouldn't have put our faith in Messiah if we didn't love him. But God wants us to know that we know that we love him, right? Because reality checks can be the biggest thing, especially if we're in our own little box in our own lives and we're stuck in the everyday minutia of the world and we don't think there's an end and it goes on and on and on and on and on. Sometimes we need that reality check of the love that we have for God and the love that he has for us. And God tests us to prove our love sometimes to remind us how much we love him and to know where we're at. Because what can our love for God usher in his presence. His presence is what is most important in our lives. And that's what our love can prove. Prove that his presence indwells in us every single day. We see that Abraham proved his love. Chapter 22, verse, 11, or verse 10. And Abraham, like I said, reached out with his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But in verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, Hineni, here I am. Verse 12, he said, do not reach out your hand against the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. In that moment, Abraham was about to slay his son. Kill the promise. 
God says, no, you've proven your love. And in that moment, I believe that Abraham had a moment of clarity, understanding that he would follow God to the ends of the earth and do anything that he said. But he believed that anything was possible through God. Anything is possible for God if we follow him in our day and age. No matter how technologically advanced our world may be, no matter how complicated government policies or, so, or how complicated society can be, anything is possible because we love God and he loves us. And he can get us through anything. A big part of proving our love is also understanding that we are capable of loving. If we love God as, as hard and as emotional and as intense as we're capable of loving, how much more the people that surround us? How much more the people that actually need that love, that need God's love? It's a reminder, a reality check. And that's what proving our love can do. So God wants us to prove our love on a daily basis by giving it our all. Continue in our outlines, it means God will provide. We are his children. We understand that God views us as little, little children that he raises up the moment we become a believer. He is growing us every single day. And he cares for us. Beyond our wildest imaginations, he cares for us. And he wants us to succeed in every point in life. And he wants to provide for us. As God provided for Abraham. Go back into Genesis 22. After the angel of the Lord tells Abraham, don't slay your son. In that moment in verse 13, Abraham's then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham, provide, and Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Folks, God was going to provide for us. It may not seem like it at this point, or wherever you're at in life, but God's going to provide for you. No matter where you're at as far as obstacles you may be facing, or people who are coming against you saying that he's not going to, I'm taking the time this morning to remind you that he's going to provide, because he wants to, and he will. He provided for humanity in the ultimate way, through his son Yeshua, through that sacrifice. God did not have to do that. He chose to do that because he loves you so much and he wants to provide for you on a daily basis. 2,000 years before Yeshua's sacrifice, King David actually wrote about it and wrote about the sacrifice and this provision. In Psalm 22, verse 14, it says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a piece of pottery and my tongue clings to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have, has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and they cast lots for my clothing. God took the sins of the world, the scorn of the world, upon himself so that that ultimate price could be bought for our salvation and paid for if we simply put our faith in that, in that provision, that ultimate provision in Yeshua's sacrifice. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, However, it was our sicknesses that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. Yet we ourselves assume that he had been afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated, but he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. 
like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, for the wrongdoing of my people to whom the blow was due. But the Lord desired to crush him, causing him grief. If he renders himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant will justify the many, for he will bear their wrongdoings. He has bared everything. Our past, present, and future anguish on himself so that we can continually go to him and ask for his help, and he will provide without a doubt every single day. He's there for you. He's just a conversation away. Because I love to look at prayer not as a prayer, as an official structural prayer. It's a conversation. It's a relationship. It's a two-way relationship. You talk to God, God can talk to you and empower you to do things beyond your wildest imaginations and provide for you. Verse 12 in Isaiah 53. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the plunder with the strong, because he has poured out his life unto death, and he was counted with the wrongdoers. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the wrongdoers. Yeshua not only intercedes for you, but he interceded for the unbelieving as well. The people who are in this world who have not experienced God's love yet, the people who we are called to reach out to, God provided for them as well. Without this provision, we can't have a personal, we couldn't have a personal relationship with God. There is a veil. There is a separation. But because of this provision, we can have that direct access to the ultimate creator, the ultimate comforter. So let's bring it all together here. Risking it all, it means giving it your all, right? It means understanding that every single day you wake up, you have to be two feet in, fully committed to representing God in the way that he wants, perfectly in line with his will, and risking being looked down upon by the world risking the pressures and the uneasiness of what people are going to cast on you who think that you're not doing the right thing in your life. So there's some things that I want to give you to go home with today and to kind of think over, to digest, to mull over. And every single day, think about these things and use it as motivation to keep walking, to keep risking it all. Keep having your two feet in. And the first thing is we will be tried, but we need to obey him. Obey God. Obey what's in his word. Understand that what you're reading is the lifeline that God is giving you to be successful in life, to overcome the world. But you remember, you're going to be tested, just like Abraham was. Just like Abraham was called to sacrifice his only son, the promise. You're going to be tested in ways that you might not seem you can overcome. But by obeying him, by considering what he says in his word, we can overcome it. Follow his lead. Try every door in your life. And if that door's locked, move on to the next one. But once you find that open door, walk through it. Obey him. Number two, God is in control. So we have to surrender it all. Remember, surrendering the expectations of how your life is going to go surrendering what the world wants for you and what the world has said in your ear what you should want. Surrender that. Put that completely to the side and consider what God wants for your life and wherever you're at. God is in control. He's sovereign in every aspect. Remember that God's burden is easy. The world's isn't. God's burden and his yoke is light. The world's isn't. It's constantly going to try to break you down. Remember that he is control and submit to that. 
Surrender to God's control in your life. Three, we can trust him because his timing, it's perfect. Always, no matter what happens, his timing is perfect. There have been times in my life where I've wanted answers. God, where are you taking me? God, what's the next step? God, I need you to shine light on where I need to go. He did eventually show me the answers, but it wasn't in my time. It wasn't where I wanted to be and where the answers come in the time slot I wanted to. It was in his time. And when I look back on it, it was perfect. His timing is perfect. And he's going to get you through the things he's going to get you through. Remember that. His timing is perfect. Four, it proves our love and shows how much, shows how much we love him and reminds us of how powerful that love is. Sometimes the, rem- sometimes the reminder of that love is the best medicine for wherever we're at in life. God's love can take us through things that are life-changing. And without it, we wouldn't have been able to get through it. Remember, Abraham had to be reminded. God tested him. God knew how much Abraham loved him. We understand that Abraham left his home to go do, obey God. Was he even going to sacrifice his son? God knew that Abraham loved him, but God wanted Abraham to know how much Abraham loved God. He wanted to remind Abraham, I follow the one true God who's able to get me through anything and has promised me, to make, promised me that I will be a father of many nations. And as we look forward thousands of years later, God fulfilled that promise. And through Abraham's line, we are redeemed through Yeshua. Number five, God will bless, provide, and reward us for risking it all. He wants to bless you. Remember, he wants to provide for you. He wants you to be successful in life and whatever you're doing. He wants you to be prosperous. He doesn't like seeing you go through things that test you negatively. But sometimes he puts you there for a reason. Sometimes he understands that it's the best thing for you to do at that time in your life. He wants to bless you if we just risk it all, every single day, by giving it our all. Remember, two feet in. If we risk it all, we can experience that peace. God's peace that transcends all understanding. We not, might not understand what's going on in our lives right now, but if we seek him, we can have that peace that will get us through every single day and continue to motivate us to keep walking. Risk it all, folks. Give it your all. It's totally worth it. Because you have a God who is all-powerful, who's on your side, who's your shield against the world, and who wants to reflect his love into the world that's dark. But his love can change everything. Remember that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the tests that you put in our lives. Thank you for being our shield and for providing for us when we need it. We understand that risking it all is not easy. We understand that being two feet in is not the easiest thing to do in this world. But we know that as believers, we're called to do that because we're different. We have a greater hope, a greater understanding of the big picture. And throughout these past 10 days of awe, Lord God, and going forward up, leading up to Yom Kippur, I pray that you give us the wisdom and the reflection that we need to really learn from our mistakes in the past to understand where you're leading us, to give us the courage to keep risking it all and following you, even if the path is foggy and we can't see in front of us. 
We know that you're going to provide and you're going to bless us because you want to. You provided that ultimate sacrifice that we can have direct access to you and we can speak to you now. And we thank you for that. So once again, thank you for your Shabbat. I pray that the rest of this week leading up to Yom Kippur will be restful and filled with a time of fellowship and meaning as we go into this next year. So thank you for it. And I pray this in your son Yeshua's name. Amen. Hi, this is Austin Kustik with Shuva Israel in Irvine, California. Don't forget to click the Shuva logo to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss a Shuva video. Tadabashem Yeshua.